Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me bid you a very, very great welcome here to UNSW and to the fourth in the series of inaugural professorial lectures. Um, in welcoming you to the university, I would like to show my respect by acknowledging the Bejigal people, the traditional custodians of the land. I would also like to pay my respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend, extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be present here today. Um, this year we have introduced the idea of professorial inaugural lectures. Um, to those who have been newly appointed, those professors who've been newly appointed to the university or to those who've, who've gained promotion to the rank of professor at UNSW. It's somewhat astonishing, I think, that we haven't done this before, but it's a new tradition and I hope I don't know if it's a tradition yet, but it will be a tradition. Um, we are exceptionally, exceptionally proud of our professoriate. And these lectures give us a forum where our new professors can introduce themselves to others at UNSW, to the UNSW community, and, and from all sides of the academic spectrum. It's an opportunity to hear from our professoriate in their own discipline and in disciplines which are, which are often quite different to those uh, of the people in the audience. Um, today I would like to introduce to you, to you Professor Pierre Del Moral. Professor Moral joined the university in 2014 as a professor in the School of Mathematics and Statistics. Since 2007 he's been a research director at INRIA, I -N -R -I -A, the French Institute for Research in Computer Science automation. For those of you who are on the ball, you'll realise that the acronym didn't add up to what I just said, but that's because my French is not as good as I was going to try and pronounce the, uh, the correct acronym. In 2011 to 2014, he also joined the Applied Mathematical Centre of the Polytechnic School in Paris as a professor, chargé de course. After a master's degree in pure mathematics in 1989 in the University Paul Sabatier in Toulouse in the field of cohomology, dynamic systems, hyperbolic geometry and algebraic geometry, he joined the Laboratory Analysis and Architecture of Systems in Toulouse. He obtained his PhD in 1994 in signal processing with one of the first studies in nonlinear filtering and optimal control problems. From 1992 to 1995, he also served as a lecturer in mathematics at the National School of Aeronautics and Space as a research engineer in the company Steria Digi Digilog, working on particle fil filters in tracking problems arising in radar and sonar signal processing. In 1995, he joined the CNRS as a junior research fellow in mathematics and physics at the probability and statistical department of the University Paul Sabatier in Toulouse. And in 2002, he received the higher degree, the HDR in mathematics. In 2004, he joined the University of Nice and Sofia and Antipolis as a full professor of mathematics in the field of probability and stochastic processes. He's been a visiting professor, professor in the Russian Academy of Sciences, as well as at several international universities, including Beijing, Cambridge, Edmonton, Erlangen, and the list goes on. He's a, he's a former associate editor and associate editor of a number of journals in the area of stochastics and applications of stochastics. Professor Del Moral is one of the principal designers of the modern and recently developing theory on stochastical particle methods in nonlinear filtering, numerical physics, engineering and information theory. He's published over 100 papers um, and he's the author of several books. His current research interests include Bayesian interference, nonlinear filtering, tracking multiple targets, the analysis of rare events, calibration and uncertainty propagations in numerical codes. 
He's just been nominated for the Medallion Lecture at the World Congress of Probability and Statistics in Toronto in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me introduce Pierre Del Moral to give you a lecture. So thanks for the invitation to give an inaugural lecture here. I'm very uh, honored to do that. Um, I'm mainly a mathematician, uh, but I've been working in between the fields, uh, according uh, uh, physics, biology, information <coughs> theory, and mathematics, of course. Uh, in, in fact, if you look uh, carefully, you will see that a lot of algorithms and uh, models have been invented in physics or in biology and things like that. And the, the role of the mathematician is really to formalize this model, to see the limits of application of these uh, models, and, um, and also to, to, to make some bridges between uh, physics, biology, and the mathematics. Uh, so that I think it's the role of the mathematician to do this type of uh, object. <coughs> so to illustrate the beauty of these uh, bridges, I have uh, chosen this bridge of uh, Claude de Monet on uh, a bridge on the pond of uh, water lily. Okay, so the talk will be uh, maybe a, li a bit long. I will start to give you some uh, stochastic particle methods principle and to show you how they are used in biology, in uh, fluid mechanics, in physics, in computer science, and in statistics and signal processing. Then I will show you, I will discuss the origins of uh, these uh, heuristic-like methodology sometimes the origin of mathematics, the, the mathematic part, and then show you some impact in signal processing and statistics, which is, uh, in fact, I'm in the statistic and mathematics department, so I will show you the impact of this on these subjects. Then I will give you some uh, elements of feynman kac integrations, uh, some key convergence results, just to show you uh, some things we can prove mathematically. And then at the very end, if I have some time, I will show you some very concrete application I did uh, during my last 10 years, and some concrete industrial technology transfer. And so I not only try to do the mathematics, but also to apply this uh, type of methods. So I, I'm obliged to start with the biology, because in, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, as a mathis mathis mathematician, I will start with the definition of mean field particle methods. And in fact, these techniques can be thought as a universal interacting sampling modeling techniques. And you can see there are two types of interacting particle model. The first part is diffusive particle models. So basically, it's a type of stochastic differential equation or dynamical system in which one, one particle interacts with the other ones. And this type of system is driven by a Brownian motion. So that, that's why we call that diffusive particle models. And they are known uh, under the name of mckin vlasov type models. The other type of uh, uh, particle model, and that's the main uh, model I will discuss today, is, uh, are branching and interacting jump particle models. And uh, so these type are, for example, Boltzmann equation and the feynman kac type model. But I will return on, on this model later during this talk. So I'm obliged to start with particle models in biology because I think they really in this, uh, start in, in this field. So first, everyone knows the deterministic model. So there are to, uh, totally uh, dynamical systems which are deterministic, like the logistic equation, the log tau Volterra. And this type of models typically represent the evolution of proportions, but uh, let's say limiting proportions. So just numbers between zero and one of one species and the other species, they are competing or not competing and so on. But if you are let's say, so, uh, some probabilists, you are tempted to add some noise, of course, f because the, the models are uh, formalized mathematical models. They don't take into account the interaction with the environment. They are not totally um, uh, precise. So one way to say is to say, for example, my model is this model plus or minus some noise. Okay, so it's just to make something more robust when you do the analysis. And another type of idea is to, instead of working with the proportions, proportion means proportion of individual of a given type, for example, you work with the individual based model. So you work at the level of the individuals. One individual infects another, the other individual do that, and so on. So these are more refined, and the, f uh, and the action of the individual on the interaction between them 
appears as some random clocks. Uh, so all of these type of models, the stochastic ones, you can see there are some branching population dynamics. So you see what does it mean? Birth and death processes uh, and genetic type par mod particle model. And typically you, you can trust the, the ancestry and the genealogical tree associated to this model. And if you look backward in time, this corresponds to the coalescent theory. Uh, and the type of evolution of these uh, ran random uh, systems evolve they are usually using two types of uh, transition. The first one are branching rates. They are also called genetic drift. Some people are doing evolving in some adaptation. So they select uh, one each other. One is a nice position and the other one is not so in a good position. Not one dies, the other one duplicates, anything like that. So it's really related to some type of selection. And between selection, the people evolve in the state space. So the, this is called the state exploration, the genetic variation or the evolution, or more uh, in a genetic language, mutation. So the, 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 the individual mutes in, in some uh, state space. So these are uh, another type of application of particle models are in physics, and particularly in fluid and gas dynamics and condensed matter. So you have the Burger, Burger's equation, the disorder system using particle systems. The Boltzmann equation are typically the evolution of molecules colliding one each other. So there are some jump in the space of velocities. Uh, and, and all of these models correspond to some mean field interaction evolution of particles. So you see, for example, one particle colliding with the other ones. And so if you take into account all the particles, of course, each particle interacts with the occupation measure of the, of the whole system. This is what we call mean field interaction in the sense that each one interacts with the, all, the, all the system. Okay, so again, there, are, there is a state exploration, diffusion or deterministic evolution of particles. There are some jump or colliding models, for example, the, the collide, collision between molecules, as I said, in the gas. So you can trust the genealogy of the shocks and the collision. So this is another example of particle evolution you have, we have seen in biology. This is in physics. Another type of application of particle metals in physics are, are, are used in molecular dynamics and quantum systems. Of course, in this situation, the state space, for example, is the, is the configuration, an electronic configuration around one atom, so that's the state space, and one particle corresponds to one configuration. So you see that that's why people in this field doesn't call this particle method. They call that the walkers. So it's a way to explore this type of spaces. To compute the, spot, the stop of the spectrum of Schrodinger brown state, people are using this type of methods. And they call that quantum and diffusion Monte Carlo. Or, and the, 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 the selection transition, which is, for example, one configuration is, has a too high energy you kill it, and another configuration as a normal energy, you duplicate it. They call that the quantum teleportation sometimes, or the reconfiguration Monte Carlo, or the particle absorption. There are other types of application of particle methods when you try to sample Boltzmann-Gibbs measure, like polymers and, and uh, ferromagnetic models. This is called the Rosenblut pruning polymer simulation. And uh, all of these uh, methodologies are used, are based on the same principles. So these are genetic type interacting evolution. As I said, people in physics call that walkers. Each walker is one configuration, for example, of a, a molecular configuration. The, they, the, the walkers explore the space using diffusion or twisted evolution or using random mutation again, as before. There are some branching rate because if you explore pl places where the energy is too high, uh, you are tempted to, uh, the particle or the configuration is absorbed. And if you explore the spaces where the energy is normal, then you duplicate to explore better, uh, starting from this type of configurations. So again, we recover the same type of evolution, mutation, selection, and, path, and the, if you look at the past particle, then you can trace back the genealogical tree evolution of this, uh, these uh, methods. So again, all of these methods I have written here evolve according to exactly the same uh, mathematical model. So now particle models in uh, computer science, so it's even maybe uh, easier to describe. In this situation, you need to optimize some function or, count, or you have some counting problem or you need to inverse some uh, function. 
And in this situation, in artificial intelligence, they have a lot of strategies. Uh, usually they call that meta heuristic or randomized algorithms or evolutionary computing. And again, they use the same type of evolution, the genetic algorithm. The genetic algorithm is a kind of exploration of the solution space. So you try to perforate the solution space so that to improve each time the solution. Uh, in operation research, they have the same uh, strategy to explore the space of solutions. And uh, they call that subset sampling or cloning or restart method or multi-splitting. And here is the same subset, uh, subset sampling. For example, you try to put some sample in a given very small set. And so you, you start shaking the particle in a given set, select the one which have succeeded to pass in a lower set, shake them, select the one, shake them, and so on. So it's exactly the same evolution as before. It's a genetic type interacting evolution in solution spaces. So you explore the space, you do some random search in the solution space, or you do some mutation, it's again the same type of strategy. The selection is simply a way to say that this solution is better than the other one. So you, there, there is, so you can, some people call that you filter the solutions. Some are bad, you destroy them. The good one, you keep them. You can call that the branching because some individuals are killed but the other one duplicates. Or the uh, one I really like is uh, this, type of, um, uh, this type of name, go, go with the winner. It means that if you're not the winner, you die. If you are the winner, you attract the other ones. But you see, it's ag again the same style. It's again a mutation and a selection. And of course, if you again you look at the past particle, you can trace back the geological tree of all the particles which are uh, been born in a given in, in, in these spaces. So now, particle methods in statistics and signal processing, uh, in particularly in Bayesian statistics and machine learning and data assimilation, uh, they use what they, what is called sequential Monte Carlo or population Monte Carlo. Uh, in nonlinear filtering, signal processing, and partial observation models. Uh, they call that particle filters, condensation, bootstrap, genetic filters. But all of these, uh, all of these names correspond to exactly the same <coughs> algorithm. And you have, again, a genetic type interacting particles, which can be interpreted as a stochastic adaptive grid. So you have some mutation, which is also called or correspond in filtering as a prediction or the forecasting in data assimilation problem. So the particle try to predict where it is. And then you, you have some observation, and the observation allows you to say that this prediction is more likely than another one. So you kill the bad prediction and you duplicate the good ones. And then you start the search from the good prediction, and you start again exploring the from there new prediction, and, and so on. So you see that it's exactly the same me uh, mechanism. Mathematically, there is no difference. You have the mutation, the selection, and the selection is also called in filtering updating or the analysis in data assimilation. And if you look at the path particles, again, you have the same notion of genealogical trees. Okay, so now I will just uh, discuss the origins of these heuristic-like methodologies. So in the beginning of this lecture, I've shown you that the same style particle methods appear in a lot of disciplines, biology, physics, uh, engineering, uh, computer science, signal processing, and we see that they are, sometimes they are used to model some phenomenon and sometimes to solve some problems. So, uh, but most of the time they are presented as heuristics, uh, they, uh, heuristics that work pretty well. And uh, the, uh, but, but there are now some uh, mathematicians which have tried to solve this problem to show that uh, to show that these uh, methods are consistent, that to show that the <laughs> models are consistent. So here are the origin of the uh, heuristic-like methodologies. So for branching processes, I think it starts with the, the work of Galton in 1973. In particle physics, uh, I put some names like the Fermi, uh, Harris, and Kahn. Genetic algorithms start with, with the work of Turing in the 50s, Barry Shelley and the Australian uh, uh, biologist Pfizer. In molecular chemistry, they, are, they were introduced by Rosenblut and Rosenblut, and so on. And all of these were presented, as I said, as heuristic, without any proof. They just work well, and that's it. If you look now, more recently, that was in the 90s, the part particle filter <coughs> methodologies, they were introduced by three group of people. The first one is uh, Gordon, Salmon, and Smith. They call that the bootstrap filter, in fact, the bootstrap Monte Carlo filter. They're, they're published uh, in 93. 
Another group was uh, the group of Kitagawa in Japan. He called, it, he called that the Monte Carlo filter. Uh, he published that in 93, it was in Japanese, then in 96. And uh, I wa when I did my PhD with some other colleagues, uh, with the supervisor, Gérard Salu, we did a PhD on this subject. And we were working, of course, there were classified defense industrial contract. It was, uh, there exist, of course, we cannot show them, but nowadays uh, particle filters are well known, so I think they can declassify totally things. But anyway, the term particle filter was coined in my first article I did in Markov processes and related fields in 1996. And this was uh, one of the first proof of this uh, type of uh, heuristic. Again, all of these papers were presenting particle filters as a, as a type of heuristic that work well in filtering. Okay, so now let's enter into the rigorous mathematical analysis, because as I said, usually the methods are developed in physics, in biology, and so on, and the mathematician, their role is to study the convergence of these methods and the consistency. So for branching process, I think the very first study starts with the work of bien -Aimé, Kendall, Harris, and uh, Jacques Neveu and Brigitte Chauvin in 96. And of course, there are plenty of names. I cannot write all of them because in for branching processes, I think we can do one conference only on branching processes with 300 people. I just put the first names. Uh, for interacting makin blasov type diffusion, which are typically uh, uh, dynamical system interacting or which in which one particle interact with the other uh, configuration of the particles and, and driven by Brownian motion, so there are no jumps. So the, in this case, you have this type of, the, this series of people which have uh, done some study on that. And for Boltzmann type, type collision process, which are closer to this process I would like to discuss with you today, this, uh, these are interacting gem processes. So it, it's exactly what, if something dies in the given place and another place you have two, so it's a, you can interpret that like a gem. So these are some people which have worked in this subject, and the very first people working on this subject. So uh, all of these uh, results are nice, but uh, usually there are a lot of problems. So often there are asymptotic results because usually you, you can prove, for example, central limit theorems or large deviation or moderate, something like that. But these are asymptotic results. So you cannot expect to find some something useful in practice to understand why it works for a long time or things like that. So most important issue is that typically all of these studies contain very poor estimates. So for example, if you use grand val lemma or induction proof to say something works at time t, let's prove it works at the next time. You use some type of induction, so grand, grand val type lemma, and you get the error is less than the, uh, the exponential of the time, sometimes is exponential of 1,000 times the time, divided by the number of particles. So that means that if you want this to be useful, you need to have an exponential number of particles, very huge, to guarantee the performance for a long time. So of course, the, these are very nice mathematical results. And in fact, mathematically, you can prove that any type of algorithm works. Everything works in mathematics. So but now if you, if you check it, it, sometimes it doesn't work. So I think this type of estimate can be proved for any type of algorithm, even the one, the one that doesn't work in practice. So and, and in fact, all of these studies have no information on the long time performance and the robust, robustness just because of this type of errors. There are no information on the convergence towards some limiting probability measure, which are also called quasi-invariant measure, fixed point, ground state in physics. Not a single uniform convergence result with respect to the time horizon. For example, impossible to find that the error is uniformly controlled by, let's say, 10 divided by the number of particles. So that was very the challenge is to prove that uniformly in time, you will never make an error more than 10 divided by the number of particles. And again, no information on the path and the genealogy of the processes. So there were some drawbacks uh, on these techniques. So again, another drawback is that from the, the 50s to the night to 96, there were not a single convergence result on genetic type algorithm. When I'm saying genetic type algorithms, these include particle filters, multi-splitting algorithms, diffusion Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo, all of these techniques I have described previously that are used in physics, introduced even in physics in the 50s, nothing was proved between 50s and 96, except that they were working pretty well in practice. 
So of course, it's natural uh, and, and they work very well, but the, the important question is how to ensure the consistency, consistency of the algorithm. Of course, it, for physician, it's not a problem. You just check one example, two examples, three examples. It works, it's done. For a mathematician, it's not really convincing. You want to find the proof of that, the limits of this, and so on. Uh, is there some bias or unbiased estimate? Uh, there were a lot of things were written on this subject because it's sti still people are thinking that things are biased or unbiased. They don't really know just because sometimes there is a, there is a wall between the disciplines and people doesn't read what the other one is doing and that's it. The language, I think, is sometimes a, a problem. What are the precision parameters? So here, of course, is the number of particles, but how to tune the number of particles if you want a given precision with respect to a time horizon, for example, and how to ensure the performance with respect to the time parameters. So these are very important questions, not only in, in uh, field three, but also in physics and so on. Or if you do some uh, industrial contract, you, you, you cannot, because all, all of these techniques are based on random stochastic algorithms. If you uh, give uh, this type of algorithm to solve a question, one day you solve it, you have one result. The other day you solve it, you have another result. And uh, each day you have a different result. In the average, it's okay. But if you have different results all the time, you really need to control how this sequence of errors are distributed. Typically, that's the central limit theorem. But you want to estimate what is the probability to make an error, for example. So these are important questions. Okay, so the, the, my main contribution, in fact, I started in 96, was to develop a feynman cat particle methodology. So I've been working on this subject since among uh, almost 30 years. And uh, this model, I was obliged to abstract. Uh, so of course, they, they look a little abstract, but, at, at, uh, but they contain all of these models. So you, you can give me diffusion Monte Carlo, or particle filter, sequential Monte Carlo. All of these methods, I give you exactly what is the choice of, uh, uh, let's say, the, the, the Markov chain, which is the choice of the fitness function that, corres that, that correspond to the feynman cat model. So in fact, this is a mathematical model that encapsulates all of these techniques. So the first proof I, I made was to, to show the unbiased properties of some estimates. I proved the variance and the con consistency. Uh, the second one was to prove the first uniform estimate with respect to the time horizon. This one was pretty complicated. It was to prove that uniformly in time, you will never make an error more than a constant divided by the number of particles. So that was, of course, to obtain this type of uh, estimate, you need to work a lot. You need to understand uh, the, the evolution of the limiting model and things like that. But so if you are interested into this subject, which I think uh, it's interesting from a mathematical point of view, is uh, I have written a book in 2004 on this uh, subject and all the application domain at that time because they are increasing every day. So uh, then another w then I extend this model to general discrete time infield particle models. Uh, you, uh, that was a series of John work with Alice Guillaume, Laura Miklo, Emmanuel Rio, and so other people. And I wrote another book nowadays. It's not restricted to feynman cat type model, but any type of, uh, uh, any type of interacting particle system in the mean field uh, sense. Of course, I've not done this alone. So I've worked with a lot of people and I have almost 70 <coughs> collaborators around the world. I just put the guys from UNSW and CSIRO, <coughs> some of them are here. So Pavel, uh, Garrett, Robert. And uh, so if you really want to do interactive in, uh, interdisciplinary research, you are obliged to work with people that know more than you on a given subject to exchange the ideas. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's, let's look, as I said, at the impact in signal processing and in statistics. From 1960s to the, to the mid-1990s, uh, we had old-style methods to solve the filtering problems. Uh, of course, you, you, everyone knows the Kahneman filter is used for linear Gaussian models, but if the things were non-linear and non or non-Gaussian, people were using the extended Kahneman filter. Basically, you have a model, uh, the noise is non-Gaussian. You say, okay, they are non-Gaussian. Let's say that I look at the, the average and the variance, and I do it as if there were Gaussian. Something is non linear, you make the derivative locally, and let's say it's linear. So, of course, these are, this is called the extended Kamen filter. It works well in dimension one or two if you have some nice system, but 
if you have some non-linearities like jumps at some times, very abrupt jumps, and you, you get into trouble. Uh, another type of method is to use deterministic grid approximation to solve the posterior distributions. But here the problem is that you cannot control the probability, the conditional probability regions. For example, if you are tracking a missile, if you are sure that the missile is staying here, you can make a grid here. But usually if the missile go away, your grid is useless. So you need to move the grid at some point. So again, this type of grid approximation work well if you are sure that what you are looking for doesn't change the location, basically. You don't know where exactly, but it will not go out of this uh, type of region. So of course, uh, uh, we, we had also the Bayesian computational stat revolution 25 years ago, but they were mainly based on Markov chain Monte Carlo methodologies. So typically, you look at the posterior distribution, and you see that as the invariant measure on, of a Markov chain. And you run the Markov chain, such that after long runs, after burning periods, if you look at the occupation measure of this Markov chain, you obtain the target measure, which is the posterior distribution. So this is uh, what people were using uh, you, you, um, to solve these uh, filtering problems. The main drawback is that you require analytic expression for the conditional. So typically, you are obliged to work in fast phase because you can uh, you can compute the posterior distribution in filtering in pi space point-wise, but you cannot compute the marginals. Uh, they are too long to converge to the target distribution because it typically is a pass phase problem also. They are not sequential because, for example, if you try to find uh, where is the plane given 10 observations, you run your <coughs> MCMC kernel, and now you have 11 observations. Uh, you need to restart from the beginning. It's not adaptive. It's not sequential. Okay, so the target measure changing at each time, you are obliged to change the MCMC kernel at each time. So that is really time consuming. So there are not really learn, uh, le learning algorithms which adapt each time to new observations. And uh, they were absolutely not adapted to parallel or high performance computing because here it's an MCMC, uh, uh, it's an MCMC model. So there is only one Markov chain. The guy is trying alone to solve the problem. Is evolving, accept, reject, for example, in the Metropolis ST style algorithm. He proposed, accept, reject, he proposed, accept, reject. He do that alone. Nobody helps him. So uh, of you, can do you cannot do parallel computing on this one. OK, so now uh, particle filters, in fact, the impact on in statistics and signal processing is that it was a new revolution in the sense that it provides a general solution for nonlinear, non Gaussian problems. So now if you ask people in working in signal processing, usually they say Kalman filter is for linear Gaussian model and particle filter is for nonlinear model. So I think nowadays particle filters have entered into the community in signal processing, even if it's exactly the same model people are using in physics since the 50s, but if they enter in, in this community and nowadays they are used, it was a big revolution because the advantage is that this provides a stochastic ad adaptive grid approximation, very simple to implement because it's a genetic type algorithm. You explore, accept, which you explore, select the good one, explore again, select the good one. You keep the population constant using proportional uh, selection, and that's it. So they are very simple. Nowadays, we have rigorous foundation and sharp mathematical convergence results. We know that we, we know uniform control with respect to the time parameter. I have discussed on this uh, um, earlier. We know that we, uh, the, the, the unbiased estimate of uh, the filtering equation up to some constant, which are called the unnormalized uh, partic uh, particle models. And we can estimate the likelihood function using particle, and we have unbiased estimate. And they are, of course, adapted to parallel and high performance computing, even if I think nowadays this subject is not so well developed. OK, so now I, let's, we enter into the second part of the, the, the lecture, is how it works. So maybe it will be more interesting for mathematicians how this uh, method works. So in fact, as I said in the beginning, this can be seen as a particle interpretation of feynman kac path integral. So of course, this name looks very uh, close to physics, a little complicated. It's not very complicated. If you just look at the particle evolutions, they are based on simply two ingredients. The first one is the free exploration 
which is given by the Markov chain transition. So let's suppose that you have a Markov chain, X, and you move from a given time to another one. The state space may change, maybe color, uh, I don't care, the state space may change in time. I simply need a Markov transition. So this is called the mutation, the proposition, you propose a step, or the free exploration of the worker or the particle of what you want. The other ingredient is that each time you explore the space, you have a way to see if, the, if this location is good or not. So you, have some, you weight the state of the path by some potential function. So I simply need a function that tells me that if I am somewhere, it's good or not. The more it's high, the better it is. If it's zero, I don't like that. Okay? If it's new, it's a very poor place. My, my French, uh, my French accent, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> okay. So these are called the, se the selection, the fitness, the likelihood, or the ad adaptation. So it's simply a way to say that this location is good or not. If it's, if it's not good, it's, it's almost zero. If it's very good, it's very, uh, very large. Okay, just to remember that. So of course, the, the particle will evolve according to the mutation and the selection, and they interact with each other. I will just show you. For example, in the beginning, you, sta you start with seven particles. The red will be the particle and the evolution, and uh, the blue will be the selection potential. So for example, this one is not so good because its potential value is uh, not very large. So this one will be destroyed. So the success is seven. Uh, 6 over 7, the proportion of success, because this one has disappeared. But the, the one that which has disappeared is reintroduced in the system uniformly. So in fact, I resample or I make a jump of the, the particle which has disappeared into the occupation measure of the system. So for example, it goes here. So now I have two particles here, one, 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 and one, but two here. If now I explore the space, because I had two particles, now I have two exploration from here. These particles are not so good. The proportion of success is only four by seven now, because only these ones were quite nice. But the other ones are destroyed, <coughs> they are rejected, they are not selected, as you want to call that, but they are re-injected into the best one. Into the best one, it means that they interact with the empirical system, with the empirical measure of the system, weighted by the potential function. So of course I don't enter into the mathematical uh, details of that, but just remember when one is rejected, it's re we, we resample using the empirical measure of the system weighted by the potential function. And of course, I, I doing that, I, the bad ones are re-injected into the system. So here they start two from here, two from here, one and two, and I continue the process. Each time I count the proportion of success. And I iterate, and I iterate like that. And at the end, I obtain some genealogical tree. I said this one, this corresponds to the genealogical tree. Each line is one vector. So you have one line, two lines, three, four, seven lines. Each line is a vector, that's all. And you have the product of the proportion of success. You have the occupation measure of the system at a given time. What happens if the number of particles is increasing to the infinity? So it means that if you have more and more computational power. In fact, you have no choice. If you take one ancestral line, <coughs> when the number of particles is infinite or very large, it's like if you are sampling according to these measures. In fact, these measures are very simple. It's the law of a Markov chain you are sampling weighted by some product of the potential function you are using to select the good, the good one. Okay, it's quite simple. You s uh, each line is a sample of the, the law of the chain, but weighted by the product of the potential function. Here are some examples why this is useful. If you take the potential function, the indicator function of some set, so that means that you kill if you go outside the set and you keep if you are inside the set, the one you, you, you destroy outside the set are re-injected uniformly among the good ones which are in the set. And then you move around, kill the one outside, 
duplicate the one inside, and so on. If you do that, you sample the law of the Markov chain given its stay in the given tube. And this may be difficult. Let's try to, people who know run, uh, simple random walks on two dimensions, try to sample a random walk in two dimensions given the fact that it stay in this tube for three years. And this may take a lot of time to sample that because at some point they go out and you miss uh, the target. So, but if you use these techniques, which I have not invented, they were introduced in physics uh, for a long time ago, and that's a way to sample approximately according to the law of the, the Markov chain given its stain in, in a sequence of steps. Another example, of course, if you take the likelihood function used in, in uh, filtering, then you solve the, law, uh, the, the posterior of the sequence of state of the signal given the sequence of observation. So you are solving the smoothing, the pass estimation, and so on. And in fact, why these methods are very successful is that any type of conditional probability can be written like that. For example, here, if you don't like the, the law of this Markov chain, you can take another one, but you, can, you need to change the function d. So that's important sampling. So you can do any type of important sampling. Then you will explore the, the, the space using these twisted uh, Markov chains, and you will select the good ones according to this change of probability measure. So there are many, many techniques which fits into this type of model. Okay, so again, that's equivalent. If you, people doesn't like this type of assertion, you can use this one. If you try to integrate among all the paths according to the feynman kag model, for example, to compute the mean of a function of that given some sequence of constraints, in this case, you simply take the average of the function of each line, each ancestral line, that's all. So now let's show you some, uh, some, uh, some convergence results. So let's say that the, the empirical average of my function of the i ancestral line, I call it one. Two is the integral when I integrate all the passes according to these feynman kag measures. So it's a complex object because you integrate over all the trajectories of the Markov chain weighted by the product of the potential function divided by some normalizing constant that you cannot even compute. So the difference between one and two, if you look at the mean, so there is a bias, it's a bias method, but the mean is, ex so if you look at the bias, it's exactly the ratio between the time divided by the number of uh, particles. So you know that if you want to have something in the average which is not so bad, you need to have the number of particles which is proportional to the time or even larger. Impossible to do better. And these are sharp because we can do also some Taylor expansions and these are exact, uh, very sharp results. It's n by n is really the range. If you look at the variance, it's of the same style, n by n. And this, of course, is true for functions which are less than one and some constant. C1 typically correspond to the bias and C2 correspond to the variance. So now if you want, as I said in the beginning, to estimate the probability to make an error. So if you look, look at this estimate, it tells you that, for example, let's suppose that x is 10. This is very small. This is close to 1, let's say 99%. If, uh, to have the, probabi the probability of this event will be larger than 99%. So if you have chosen x to be 10, you see that if you want this uh, quantity to be small, you here you will have 10, 10, these are constant, so you need to have again the ratio, small, to have something interesting that tells you that the probability for the difference between the two to be small to be more than 99%. Okay, so these are uh, what is called concentration inequality, is to estimate the probability to make an error, not only the bias, the variance, anything like that, this is the probability to make an error. The same here, if you want to make the supremum inside, then you pay a log t time here. That's all, but these are exactly the same style of error. So now if you look at the current population, so not only the ancestral line, but what you have at a given time. So of course, when you take the average of the function of each guy, you, you estimate these quantities, which are the integrals, but all the lines, but here are the terminal points. So in other words, eta n is the marginal of the measure on pass space only on the terminal time. Instead of the law of the, the trajectory of the signal given the observation, is the law of the last state of the signal given the observation. 
So in that case, why, why is interesting? Of course, interesting in filtering because it's the optimal filter even in nonlinear situation. But in physics, if you look at the long times, this corresponds to the ground state of Schrodinger operator. And this technique corresponds to the diffusion Monte Carlo method and so on. So people are interested into this technique and they want uniform estimate with respect to the time because they want to capture the limiting object. So in that situation, we have uniform control, as I said, of the bias and the variance. So it's typically the same type of result as before, but here they don't depend on the time. So the worst case is <coughs> controlled by one by the number of samples. The same if you want to look at the probability to make an error, the smallest probability can be even larger than 99% and there is no time parameter here. And if you want to put a supremum inside, here you pay a log t of time. So this type of concentration inequality are useful uh, to if you want to estimate, or maybe this one, this, this one, for example, because if you know that the difference between this one and this one is exponentially small, because you have some type of uh, the stability of the system, this evolves according to some system, it converges to this one, they are exponentially small, so when you, co instead of comparing one and two, you compare one and two, and then two and three, and this gives you the difference between one and this one. So you simply add here some exponential of minus the time. So you have very sharp expression according to the, the convergence to this ground state. Okay, so now let's look at the partition function. As I said, we cannot compute the normalizing constant. So when I wrote, I need to integrate all the trajectories with respect to the Feynman Kahn measure. Of course, it's a mathematical object because I cannot even compute the normalizing constant. So why the normalizing constant are interesting? They are called in physics partition functions, free energy or likelihood functions. If you take, for example, the indicator function, this normalizing constant corresponds to the to this quantity, which is the chance for the Markov chain to stay in the tube for three years. These are exponentially small. And what is interesting is one by n of the log, which is what is exponentially small, but what is the exponential exponent? So this is in physics, if you have this type of uh, potential function, correspond to the top of the spectrum of the Schrodinger operator. And that's why people are using this method in physics or they're interested in physics. These methods to compute this exponent. And in filtering, if you take the likelihood function, the local one, then the normalizing constant corresponds to the likelihood function. And if you have some parametric model, of course, you will have the, the, the likelihood function of the parameter with respect to the observation. And we have some, un and these are the unbiased estimate of these normalizing constants are exactly, I don't know if you remember, we had the proportion of success, six over seven, four over seven, this number, you just make the product of this number and you have an unbiased estimate of this guy. Very strange, but it's like that. Just make the product of these random numbers. If you take the average, it's exactly equal to that. If you look at the variance, it's even, they decrease to zero and so on, but it's an unbiased estimate and the variance is of order n by n, again, the time divided by n. It's always the time divided by n because here you have trajectories. Of course, instead of the proportion of success uh, in successful individual, you can take the average of the potential function. But that's a more refined estimate. But both, of course, because the mean of this is equal to that. So uh, if you want to look at the chance to make an error, we have the same style of inequalities. And this tells you that the exponential co constant I want to compute can be done uniformly in time. So if I want to compute this quantity, so the top of the spectrum of Schrodinger operator, just because it's one over n, the log of the normalizing constant, I can obtain this type of inequality. And the same for the variance, of course, if you take the variance, if you, uh, if you divide by n, you, will, uh, you take one over n log, you can have this type of estimate without the time. But of course, you can capture, you can capture the exponential exponent uniformly in time, but you cannot capture this uh, quantity uniformly in time. For this one, you pay the time. <coughs> For this one, it's fine, just because one over n here. Okay, so now, of course, all of these models I, I presented to you look very simple, uh, the variance, the bias, and so on. But just to capture the uniform convergence reserve with respect to the time, you need to study 
the, 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 the dynamic system which consists of the limiting measure eta n at each time, we have a non-linear dynamic system in the space of probability measure. If you look at the, the filtering equation, the filtering equation is a dynamic system in the space of posterior distribution. And you want to study the stability of this system. Because if you, stu if you know that the filtering equation, the, the optimal one that you cannot solve, this filtering equation is stable, just because the particle model is an approximation of a stable system, making lo local error at each time, this local error will not propagate just because the system, the limiting one, is stable. So you are obliged to study nonlinear measure value processes, the stability of this, these guys. Okay, so uh, to, to enter the stability of these models, we were obliged to study this type of uh, problems. Uh, for the analysis, we have uh, also contraction for, of nonlinear stomy groups. Uh, they, they are called in physics uh, Feynman Kag propagators. In fact, it's like the Markov stomy group, but instead of having the, the expectation of the function of the Markov at a given time, given the past, you have the function of the Markov process at a given time, weighted by product of function or weighted by exponential of an integral of a, of a potential function of the trajectory. So these are feynman kag semigroups. And if you want to study the contraction properties of these semigroups, they are a bit more complex than the contraction properties of Markov semigroups only, which is already one full subject in probability. Okay, so that's what we, we were obliged to analyze this type of object. And again, interacting particle system to prove the, what, what is called propagation of curve properties. In fact, it's simply the bias, but instead of looking of one particle, you look at two particles or three particles, and you try to say these guys are almost IID according to the right law. And in fact, you, uh, you need to measure the law of three or four guys, uh, uh, the difference with the tensor product measure to, 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 to see the difference to measure the difference between IID and, uh, and the interaction in the system. Okay, now, la, now I, I will enter into concrete application problems. So the first one was the, to how to compute the law of a Markov process given noisy and partial observation. So typically the signal, it can be the target evolution. So that's uh, the, uh, some, uh, the missile, the plane, the robot, and so on. The observation is the, some radar, sonar, or GPS observation. And you want to estimate, sorry, and you want to estimate the law of this process given this noisy <coughs> observation. So we did a lot of contract uh, in, uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, 20 or 15 years. A lot of contract, uh, or typically for uh, military and defense contract. But one was uh, forecasting problems uh, for turbulent feed uh, uh, models. Another type of application is hidden Markov chain problems. So you have uh, theta is a given parameter. It enters into some signal, which is a Markov chain, which enter and then you observe, you have partial observation of the signal and you want to estimate what is the parameter or the law of the parameter given this no noisy observation. So in that case, the parameter can be a kinetic model, uh, unknown parameter, the statistical parameter. For example, when you add some noise, you don't know the variance of these noises. Uh, the hypothesis testing, if you have two models, you don't know if it's one or the other one. So this is the parameter, take two values. The signal can be, again, a single or multiple target evolution, forecasting model, and so on. And the observation as before. And here you need to estimate the law of this parameter given the partial observation. So again, we apply a lot of, uh, again, the same type of methods of the particle filters and so on to solve this problem. There is a, a software which was built by uh, my team in INRIA, the, the team ALEA. Uh, it's called the BIPS uh, uh, software, and it runs the sequential Monte Carlo. BIPS means branching and interacting particle system for Bayesian inference. So you, uh, it's free, and you can download it on internet. We apply that to epidemiology problem, uh, echo mi microbiology. So these were very concrete problems to solve. But this is simply a software development. Another type of problem we solved using this type, exactly the same style of methods, are black box style inverse problems or rare event. You have a black box, you have some input and some output. For, uh, the black box corresponds to for, uh, some, um, some approximation of some numerical code. For example, uh, the input can be the height of the waves, can be the temperature of the sea. 
uh, the, the black box correspond to computation of the forces <coughs> on some, um, how to say that, some cable between some uh, offshore platform and, and, uh, and some an anchor. And so if the forces are too, uh, too strong, uh, this blocks like that. So the, 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 the black box corresponds to the computation of these forces. So that, uh, these are material computation, hydrodynamics, and things like that. We don't really want to know what was inside, but the problem was to compute what is the law of the input that made the output do something bad. And in that case, is the energy. When the energy was too strong, the cable uh, is broken, and the offshore platform that was before the contract we had uh, was destroyed. Okay, so that we did a lot of contracts on this subject uh, using the same style of particle method. We were exploring the space in some region, computing the good particles, killing the bad one, starting from all the good places. It was exactly the same style of uh, methods. Then in mathematical finance, we were, uh, because it's, uh, that's quite simple, US, European, or Asian option, when you put some stochastic rates or some barriers, or if you want to compute the Greeks or the derivative or self-financing portfolio, these are, you can see in the literature, they are directly related to feynman calc models, even if you have partial observation problems. And these are, of, if you do some optimal stopping problems, they are related also to Snell envelope equation. So we did a lot of application of particle models to this type of problems, and we uh, typically to do some energy, price, uh, energy pricing options and stochastic optimal control, uh, typically with EDF, which is the National French uh, Electricity um, Department. So here are some uh, research projects and new bridges I propose to develop here. The first one, are again, are in mathematics. Of course, there are a lot of things to do. For example, to study the stability of nonlinear and interacting shock diffusion. We have studied the stability of nonlinear feynman calc models. But still, there is a lot of things to be done in di for diffusion interacting job uh, <coughs> models. To study the, the <coughs> concentration inequalities for these models, so the, the chance to make an error is exponentially small. And to do refined analysis of a new range of methods, which are called particle Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. Uh, but we have started doing this type of work uh, with Robert Cohn, which is here. Uh, in computer science, I think there is a lot of work to be done on this type of methods. The first one is to try to do this. This has been done already in some parts of the literature. How to do parallel and high performance uh, computing using this technique. We, are, we can do that, for example, if you, we use island type particle models, which are typically each island is a particle model itself. There are many, many islands which turn in different type of processor. And we decide that this type of island, so this uh, computer, doesn't work so well just because the average quality of these guys are worse than this one. So then you, you can switch and reinitialize re uh, the whole system, but at the level of island. Instead of doing that at the level of individual, you do that at the level of island. And within each island, they evolve as a particle model itself. And of course, that's the degree one you can do at any degree you want. Uh, another type of idea is to use adaptive particle algorithm, how to do these type of things in parallel. That's not so clear because you, can, you, you may have different type of particle model running with different type of uh, tuning parameters which are not synchronized and this may be some other problem to, to, to exchange information between them. And another range of application domain now is uh, risk analysis and variant simulation. Statistical analysis of big data, I think that's a big name uh, everywhere in uh, Europe, US, Australia. And to solve high dimensional problems. And this, uh, it's again, there are some particle methods to, to solve multiple object filtering problems. Uh, it's of course much more difficult than filtering because instead of tracking one single target, you have plenty of targets. The problem we solved was using uh, something like 200 targets and you had not only targets, you have clutter noise arriving in the, in the from the environment, and you want to, to track all these 200 targets at the same time. And there are, again, particle methods used to solve this type of problem, and even to solve the, the association measure. Because if you assume that, if you know that one observation is coming from one target, then you assume that given 
this uh, association of the observation, everything was linear Gaussian. Of course, the only problem is to, to, to solve the association problem, to know which observation come from which target. Because if you have two target crossing, one observation may come from one or the other one. Okay, and I think the, the, the mo one of the interesting problem I saw here is to, wh when, you, um, when you use the particle methods, for example, you have a posterior distribution, like in rare event, for example. In rare event, uh, there is a, a, a different way of thinking. Instead of using the data that you have on, on all the scenario you have uh, already observed to estimate some uh, extremal uh, value uh, problem, uh, or distribution, instead of doing that here, you sample plenty of um, possibilities for this rare event to happen. Not you, no, you don't only compute the probability for this rare event to, to happen, you compute the, the law of the randomness given that this happened. So if you have plenty of samples that correspond to plenty of scenarios for which the event happened, so that's the law of some process given the rare event happened. So here is the opposite. You are creating a lot of data, and sometimes this data may be highly complex. In the example I gave previously, it was the age of waves or the temperature of the sea and the offshore platform and so on. Each sample corresponds, for example, to one curve of temperature. So what do you do when you have 20,000 curve of temperature, 20,000 curve of age of wave, and each particle has the two components, the, the curve of temperature, the curve of, of weight, a and you how to use this data. You have plenty of sample according to the posterior distribution given the rare event happened, and we don't really know how to use this data. Of course, most of the time, the industry, uh, the industry people just <coughs> ask for the reliability of the system, so they just want to know the probability for something wrong to happen but they don't want to find the law of the randomness given this happened, which I think is much more important. Okay, so thanks for... Thank you very much for that, Pierre. So my name is Merlin Crossley. I'm the Dean of Science here at UNSW. And the Vice Chancellor has set me the task of after these inaugural lectures to summarize the lecture. <laughs> and Pierre, I'm not going to summarize your entire lecture because X was 10 and N wasn't very large, so there's more than a 99% chance I will make an error. So I won't do that, but what I'll do is say a few words about how pleased I am that we have had this lecture after you've been with us for more than a year now and how wonderful it is to welcome you here. When I first met you on Skype, I was very excited about meeting a French mathematician because I'd heard of a few before. I'd heard of Pascal, Descartes, Galois. There was even one called Fermat. I would never have employed him because he never finished his work. <laughs> but. We did employ you, and it's, you've added a, a lot to our university. I was glad to see your first slide. It was interesting. You, you used my rule of giving lectures, which I like. There should be a picture on every slide. Your pictures were quite eclectic, actually. The first you showed a bridge, Claude Monet's bridge. I hope in the future you'll use the Sydney Harbour Bridge <laughs> because you're an Australian with us now. And it is indeed. You did show us bridges between physics, chemistry, and biology. And for me, this is one of the most exciting things, to move between physics, chemistry, and biology, and maths, enjoying much of what UNSW has to offer, but without ever leaving the Faculty of Science, which is the way I, I quite like it. The physics was good. We have, I saw some disordered systems there, which reminded me of Australian higher education policy. In quantum physics, we had Monte Carlo with mathematicians, particularly French ones. We always get Monte Carlo in the end. We got some random walks. I think one of my colleagues works on drunken walks, but I can do those even when I'm sober. So that's something we've learned. And you have, uh, and I saw that it was all linked through genealogical trees and evolution. And evolution is one of the things that I've always studied. I've always studied DNA, and I'm glad that. DNA started 
in around about 1953, whereas your work I saw 1845. So you have much more literature to read than I do. So I think uh, I don't envy you there. I'd finish by saying that I, I did also love the applications. I loved seeing that this could be used in so many things. I'm hoping, among other things, you will be able to fix the Greek economy, which I saw that you mentioned, and that you'll be working in the future on big data, which is obviously an enormously, and I think we have great, I was talking to Robert Kuhn earlier, we have great strengths in big data and we have to develop them at UNSW. So to sum up, I enjoyed your talk immensely. I enjoyed your passion. I enjoyed the style with which you gave the talk. It has been a rare event. And finally, I think a new motto, we've got a motto at the moment, but we should use the phrase I heard you use. When you join UNSW, what you do is go with the winner. That was the phrase I like best. So thank you very much, Pierre. And now I hand back to Les. Thank you very much, Pierre. And look, thank you very much to everybody in the audience here for, for supporting this series of inaugural lectures. I really think that it's been a fantastic experience. The first four that we had have been terrific. Um, we've, we've got more coming up. The next one in the series is Professor Sean Smith from Chemical Engineering. That's on June 23rd. We've got one from Professor Guy Marks from Medicine on July 23rd. And then there are three more slated for August. So. They are coming. They are coming in a in in sequence as as uh, as night follows day. So there will be more to come. Uh, I do look forward to seeing you at those. Uh, there are, there are some drinks and some nibbles uh, outside the council chambers in the foyer. Uh, one of the things that I think we learnt from the first few of these inaugural lectures was the the actual ability to mingle and network after these professorial lectures is as valuable as the lectures themselves. And it's been terrific to see so many of you here this evening. Look, once again, can you join with me in thanking Pierre Del Morel. Thank you, everybody.